Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome again to you all, a warm welcome today. My name is Brenton A. Burkhart. I'm gonna be your host and moderator of this program. Uh, some of you might remember me from my 15 year career at the Sloan Career Development Office, where I had the privilege of working with thousands of graduate students and MIT Sloan alumni as they were navigating critical career transition points in, in their careers. So I'm very pleased to be with you all today and want to thank the MIT Alumni Association for creating this important program that enables us to come together in a nice intimate setting to discuss working motherhood and being a working woman in 2022. Um, our hope today is to share insights and experiences that you have from navigating your journeys as working mothers. We hope that you'll be able to reflect on your own individual path and we're going to spotlight some key research and trends that can support working moms in this day and age. I think if we talk, look at the world work today, right, the norms are changing. Some things have changed, perhaps for the better, in certain sectors. And that's honestly been as a result of the pandemic, right? It's allowed much more greater acceptance of workplace flexibility, remote work, and hybrid work. But I think we can also all probably agree that there remains to be some uh, new challenges that need to be tackled. There still stands a divide between what is needed and what is actually happening. There are some complex hurdles that factor into making meaningful work work for all professionals, regardless of even whether or not someone is a parent. So our panelists this afternoon have their perspectives, their stories to share about being working women and working mothers and I am pleased to take part in the conversation as well. So let me introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, we've got Jossie Lee, MIT Sloan alumna, class of 2012. Uh, Jossie is an MIT trained innovator and she's the author of Mommy Goes to Work, which is an award-winning storybook that celebrates working motherhood. Jossie interviewed more than hundred working parents for this book, myself included, as she was shaping it. And she's the mother of two young sons, ages four and seven. So she's in the trenches. She's got a ton that she can contribute to this conversation. So welcome, Jossie. Thank you. It's also my privilege to introduce Joanne Lublin, who comes to us today with nearly five decades of experience as a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. She was its career columnist until 2020. She shared a Pulitzer Prize for her tremendous work and in 2018, she was awarded the Loeb Lifetime Achievement Award, which is the highest award in business journalism. She's the author of two amazing books about female leaders and her most recent book, Power Moms, How Executive Mothers Navigate Work and Life, uh, was published in February, 2021. So welcome, Joanne, welcome, Jossie. Looking forward to an intimate fireplace chat. But before we pivot into our conversation, we wanna involve you all into the conversation. Love to get some input from our audience. So on the screen, there should be appearing a short uh, poll here. Want to get a sense of the audience. So if you're able to please just enter the age of your youngest child, it's your youngest child, perhaps that can help us frame up our conversation today. I'll just give you a second to do that. All right. So most people have either really littles, it looks like, or 12 plus. Okay, no one in the seven to 11, although I have a 10 year old, I'm just not participating in the, in the poll here, but okay, great. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, so let's start, so knowing that, and jo Jossie and Joanne, um, you probably see the results of this poll here. I'm gonna throw my first question to Jossie. Um, Jossie, can you tell us about how you were passion and dedication to supporting working mothers led to creating your book and to meeting Joanne. Yes, of course. I'm so first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. Do you hear me okay? Wonderful. Yep. Yes. Uh, so people do ask me what is the creation of Mommy Goes to a Camp from, and I'm, to be very honest, it was inspired by mom guilt and separation anxiety. Um, so both of my boys have very bad separation anxiety, um, and then every morning the school drop off with the tears was just set, really set the tone for our days. 
Um, and so I have been really searching high and low to look for something, literally anything that can help facilitate a conversation between me and the boys about what mommy does all day, every day after I disappear from the daycare. And I just really couldn't find anything um, until one day when I was working on a presentation for work and my then three-year-old Jeremy came to me and say, mommy, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm working on a presentation. And then he said, what is a presentation? And I just said, you know, it's like your show and tell. So I felt like for the thinking, this just popped up from my mouth. And then um, he immediately get it. I was really surprised. He started to ask, so what are you sharing? Who are you sharing with? Um, and I found it fascinating that such a hard concept of presentation, you can explain to a child if you put it in the context that he understands. So that kind of start to become the main bone of the storyline um we developed so i started to think about what are the other things that we can use um in the in the activities that kids familiar with to explain what we do so we come to also team building so mommy builds her team i build my block it's so abstract but if you explain it this way they get it or problem solving mommy works on my project um on her project i work on my puzzle so really start from there as a family um project started from our kitchen table with a lot of support and testing uh, from the working mom community, including a lot of Sloney, including uh, Brain. Um, we put in, we uh, launched on Kickstarter a few months ago, um, was able to raise $30,000 from over 500 backers. And now we're developing the second book. It's for moms working at the hospital. Um, so yes, I during the process, I read a ton of book and one of the best books that I read was Power Mom. Um, so I found it not only inspiring, but also with a lot of um, actionable insights. So it's true MIT entrepreneurial spirit. I found her email and I sent her a thank you note. I didn't expect someone like her celebrity will respond to my email, but she did. <laughs> she even kindly offered a conversation. So that's how we got to know each other. And I'm so glad that we are bringing her into the MIT community today. Yes, for sure. And it's interesting, as I read Joanne's book, one of the, the tips she gives is involving your children in your work life. It used to be very separate, right? Mom goes out the door. And so Jossie, you've done just that by creating a way for, for your children to know what you're doing every day. So that's awesome. So Joanne, I'll turn to you, but for the audience who may not have read Joanne's book, I'll, I'll provide a bit of context. Um, Joanne was one of the first female reporters at the Wall Street Journal. She helped fight for gender pay equity at her employer. So she's no doubt been a trailblazer and a role model to, to many women. You have two grown children of your own. You're a grandmother. So you've now gone through that whole arc of juggling motherhood with your career. Um, so I, I want to talk about pulling from your most recent book, um, which Power Moms, you've also got Earning It. Can you talk about the differences between what you describe as the first wave of Power Moms, which are those more seasoned executive women leaders that are probably from that baby, the baby boomer generation, and this new second wave of Power Moms, which are these newer leaders that are up and coming, more millennial Gen X um, time frame. So what are those differences that you've seen? Um, I'll just start there and then I might have a, a follow-up. Well, thank you to everyone who helped make this program happen today. It's been a long gestation, but it is something I think everyone's going to benefit from. This book, Power Moms, is the reflection of looking at 86 women who become executives and also have children. But they're divided between two generations, the boomers, which is my generation, and women who were anywhere from their early 30s to early 40s when I interviewed them. Most of those were Gen Xers, about a third were millennials. And what I discovered was that there was this profound cultural shift that things actually had gotten better for women who work and also are trying to raise children even when they get to be executives where you would think it would be pretty easy and it's not because it is a long, hard slog to get to the executive level. And most of these women had their kids long before they became executives. 
But what was significant was that that younger wave, the women in their 30s to early 40s, benefited in three ways from what the earlier wave had experienced. They benefited, number one, from improvements in technology, for the fact that we've all been able, who are office based, to work from home, work remotely for the last two years when this was such a, a rare type of setup before the pandemic forced us to do that. It wasn't really an option for the boomer moms. Mm -hmm. And a second change is that relationships between these women and their significant other, whether it was a husband or a life partner, or in one case, a wife, is much different for the younger women. They don't accept it as a given that they are gonna to have to take more than their fair share of the burden of raising children and of running the household. And the third change is the workplace has changed. For these younger women, they have their choices of where to work and they don't only have one place that might be family friendly. There are companies who recognize that it's important to structure their benefits and their workplaces that are family friendly and that will attract and retain women and men alike with kids. And one of the reasons the workplace has changed is because so many of those boomer moms are now in senior management. And so they themselves can act as role models, as advocates, as mentors, as sponsors. And you pull that all together and it is much easier, but we're not home free yet. Yes. Are there lessons that you can share from the second wave of power moms that have enabled them to more capably juggle the demands and of, of motherhood and their career? Well, besides this sort of context in which it is somewhat easier, like I said, not everything is at a point where we can declare victory. And that's largely because we still live in a society of gendered role expectations. We still think that moms have to be the primary parent. All of you on this call who have children and are women, think about whose name is first on the contact list for when one of your kids gets sick at school. It's probably yours. And if it's not, the school probably skips to your name as the primary person, even if your husband or partner's name is first. And so I think this younger wave of executive moms that he interviewed have much greater heightened awareness of these gendered role expectations and are doing things to minimize the impact of that on themselves, on their professional advancement and on their home lives. And one of the ways they do that is that they constantly reinvent and recheck where things stand in terms of their relationship with their significant other. There was one younger executive mom who, because of her own executive and professional background, she and her husband had strategic quarterly planning meetings. And they began these before they got married and they've continued them. It's always done in a very friendly wine glass in hand kind of fashion late at night. But when they have to make important decisions, those come up at those quarterly meetings. Another thing that the younger wave does is they make sure that they do not fight their battles alone. They recognize the importance of having a peer network both within the workplace and outside the workplace. And they also look for advocates within their workplace who are not just women, but men as well, because the guys are still unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, in charge of the way things rule. So those are some of the ways that they cope. Thank you. That's helpful. You know, I really do agree. I think this the parenting parity that's happening with more spousal equality um, has made such a difference. When I was dropping off my fifth grader this morning, I noticed there were just as many dads at drop off as there were moms. And so that was heartening just knowing I was going in to this conversation. And yet the teachers were probably praising the dads for being <laughs> so nice as to take time out of their busy day to drop off the kids while the mothers are standing there saying, hello, where's my crib? <laughs> yes, those gendered expectations. Um, well, to that point, just around moms being lead parents, the first day my son went to preschool, my youngest son went to preschool, it was his first day. I was at MIT working and my husband was at home. 
and a mile away. And my son was so upset and couldn't get himself calmed down. They were calling my office at MIT. I was in a meeting. My husband, they called my neighbor who was my emergency contact. She went to go get my son and she noticed my husband's car was in the driveway and was like, why didn't they call you? So it just goes to show. All right, I'm sorry. I just couldn't help share that story because I- How I many just, years ago was that, Britt? That was in 2014. He was oh, three, yeah, 2014, yeah. All right, well, so let's talk about um, Jossie, your book, and maybe you can share some lessons learned too, because in true um, MIT fashion, you saw what you needed to create in the world and you tested it scientifically and make sure it met your needs and others. Um, can you share with us some lessons and insights you gained when you were doing your research on uh, make, uh, Mommy Goes to Work and how um, that might be able to help alums who are navigating working motherhood or trying to support working mothers. Yes, of course. Um, so yes, yeah, so when when we created this, you know, uh, family project, it was truly a mighty fashion. I couldn't just write a storybook. I have to test it scientifically. So we ended up testing with over 100 working moms and their employers, their partners, families, friends, and people who support them. Um, this was pre-pandemic, so we were lucky to be able to go into the classrooms and to the workplace and into people's homes and get tons of insight to make sure what we created is actually helpful and can support working moms. I think two things really strike me. Um, one is the first day return to work is a huge opportunity. It can be a valley or it can be turned, if done correctly, into a peak. Um, Without prompting, every mom that we interview talk about their first day return to work after their maternity leave. And it sounds very similar to my own experiences. I remember giving my four months old baby to the infant teacher crying and feeling a strong sense of guilt because I feel I'm abandoning my child to a, leave it to a stranger for a selfish reason because I want to pursue my personal ambition. Um, that was a horrible feeling to be very honest. And then I need to put together myself, wipe out my tears, walk into the office as if nothing happened. And I'm so excited about starting my day. Um, I also think I came into with the wrong mindset, which I learned later, a lot of moms feel the same way. We walk in the office and feeling that we need to prove to the world that we are still the same person, the same driven, ambitious, high-performing Jossie and try to separate my two worlds of the mom world and the work world, because I'm afraid people will mentally judge me that you know I'm not as a strong performer than because now I have sort of a distraction. So I, 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 I think, you know, every, and then they, so later on when I realized that for that very insights, um, that's how we are now working extremely hard to form corporate partnerships and hope that new moms returning to work can receive a gift like this from their employer um, that shows a good message of, we don't only treat you as a human resource, but like we, treat, we embrace and support you um, as a full person, we embrace your new identity. We literally just launched yesterday our first corporate partnership with uh, Relativity Space. It's a pioneering company in the aerospace industry. They This year, they are launching the world's first 3D printing rocket into the orbit, and they are giving Mommy Goes to Work to the moms on their team. Um, so we are very hopeful and, and very optimistic in seeing interest from um, corporates who are willing to give this nice gesture um, to support working mothers. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing that really strikes us is um, what moms and kids care the most is the sense of togetherness. Um, so the last storyline of it says, baby, I love you. Together or apart, I hold you in my heart, wherever we are. This is probably our 15th or 17th version of ending. Our first initial endings focus on comparison. It talk about we love each other more than we, we love work and school. And we found that moms actually don't like that because the comparisons triggers the guilt. One mom said it really well. He said, my son loves strawberry and he loves bike riding. It's like, I love my family. I love work. I, I, I want them and you know do them at different times. There's no point to compare. And the comparison triggers the guilt. guilt. 
So we asked a lot of why and then realized that what moms and kids really care about is a sense of togetherness. So center around that sense of togetherness, we iterated and eventually landed on this. How, what's the implication of that to employer? I think provide the flexibility or the support you need to your employees so that they don't, they don't force them to make a decision between their family and work because when they have to make that decision, it triggers the guilt and it, it impacts their mental health and well-being. Um, so by supporting whatever they need, whether it's a flexibility or the family uh, parental leave, the bonding time, or even like shipping milk, uh, breast milk services, you know, help them to embrace their work and life together so they can thrive and you get a more happier, more productive employee. Yeah, I hear a lot about the inclusivity, right? The blurring those lines between work and life and bringing your children in. Thank you. And, and Bryn, can I jump yeah, in here? Please. With a, another yeah. suggestion. So a couple of very forward looking employers um, in reporting this book, what they do is they offer phased return for new parents. So they say, once your parental leave is over, you may come back to work on a part-time basis. And in some cases, we will pay you full-time for you during this phased return, which can last anywhere from in most cases, uh, it lasts a couple of months. And I think that is a really positive acknowledgement of the fact that, especially for the new moms, it's a hard transition. It, even if you've had a child before, but mostly, you know, doing it the very first time and acknowledging the fact that maybe coming back part time, but rewarding your efforts with full time pay is another strong signal that this really is a family friendly workplace. Definitely. Yes. I thought those were great employers that were doing that. I don't know if we can talk about the names of the employers, but um, well, at PwC, Rent the Runway, doing some really great phase returns. Those and I love to do that, do that. Absolutely. Yes. You also had a good tip in your book, Joanne, if you're coming back from attorney leave or someone had said, perhaps one of the people you interviewed said, start on a Wednesday instead of a Monday. And that way you really only have a few days. I thought that was great. Um, okay, well, let's let's pivot actually. I wanna play out, Jossie, your, you know, the, the guilt, right? You mentioned the guilt, the guilt we feel. I mean, I so, when you first showed me your book, I said to you, I wish I had that, that when I had, when my first child was going to daycare because the guilt is so real. And so I'd love to debunk this myth of work-life balance because it really does not exist. Um, I think it needs a new framework. I've long talked about work-life flow. And so when I read your book, um, Joanne, and you said work-life sway, I completely loved that concept. So can you share with us what work-life sway is and how people are using it to successfully navigate working motherhood? Well, work-life sway is a concept that was completely foreign to me when I started reporting this book. I certainly understood the impossible ideal of work-life balance. As we all know, it's the equivalent of trying to maintain that yoga pose where you bend one leg and hold it against <laughs> your knee and then standing like that for 24-7. Yeah. It can never be achieved. Absolutely. It's a, it's a bunch of baloney. And in fact, in my first book, the one chapter I devoted to working motherhood, I use as the title a quote from one of those executives who I interviewed for the first book, Earning It. And her quote was, manager moms are not acrobats. And yet, as far as I knew, there wasn't an alternative until I started interviewing some of those millennial and Gen Xer executive moms. And one of those described to me a situation which epitomizes work life sway. And as I'm walking out of her office, she says, you know, that has a name. I was like, really? And she said, it's called work life sway. And in her situation, what had happened was she was working at her office. She's an executive at Phillips, an auction house, late one afternoon, and a video text pops up on her phone, and her toddler's taken his first steps. And her nanny knew she would want to see it live. And so idea here of work-life sway is that when we have to be present and committed and working hard, we give 110% to our work life. But if our personal life intrudes, whether it's the toddler taking his first steps or the water heater blowing up, 
we segue, we sway, and we move out of work life mode into personal life mode. And we do so without any guilt because we know how to sway back and forth as the situation requires. And nowhere has this become more important of a concept than during the pandemic when so many of us have been working from home and those boundaries between life and work don't always seem very distinct. And so feeling that it's okay to sway back and forth is part of one way of dealing with some of that guilt. So when I turn in the manuscript for this book, literally the day before the world shuts down <laughs> in mid-March of 2020, I was gonna call it Power Moms, Secrets of Work-Life Sway from Two Generations of Executive Women. And my publisher <laughs> said, great title, the subtitle will have to go, no one will have the foggiest idea of what you're talking about. But part of my mission in life is now to educate the world. And I think there are a lot more people now who've heard of it than before this book came out a year ago. Yes, for sure. I think technology has definitely helped us um, move back and forth more, more seamlessly. But there are some downsides to that too, right? Would you agree? I, I mean, just not being able to shut off sometimes is hard too. I don't know if you have any tips for that. <laughs> I yes, like them. And, and, and I think that's actually a very, very difficult problem that many of the women in that younger wave of executive moms struggle with. It, it's called being always on. And I, and I have a whole chapter on that because we feel this compulsion, partly because of these gendered role expectations and the things that Jossie was talking about, to prove that you know, we are always going to be available. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for us to kind of take a measure of ourselves and recognize that no one can possibly function effectively if they're always on. So one of those executive moms from the younger wave who was working remotely all the time as an executive before the pandemic, because she worked for an all remote company, suddenly has to adapt when the pandemic hits because now her children are in the house. They weren't there before. And yes. one of the things she does to make sure that she's not always on is she says to her, her employer, I'm going to set some boundaries as to when I am reachable. And between 7 and 11 a.m. on work days is my essentially private time. I'm going to work out. I'm going to spend time with my kids. I'm going to do whatever it is that needs to be done. And unless there is an absolute emergency and you call me on my spare phone, the one that I only have you know, available for emergency calls and it's otherwise not you know, available during that time, uh, you're not gonna be able to reach me. And so it's important that we stick up for ourselves and recognize that we cannot be effective if we are always on. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I just coached someone yesterday who was changing her work schedule and she's getting some pushback from people who were very accustomed to be able, being able to access her whenever she wanted and they were going to her boss. And so one of the things we came up with is you have to actively manage this. Go to your boss and say, here's what I'm doing so I can be more productive at work. And there might be some, you know, there might be some scuttlebutt around it, but I've got it, you know, so just kind of owning that maybe and, and being intentional about our schedules, I think, and, and honoring them so that we can honor all parts of our life. But I think it's also important, just like I was talking before about revisiting and resetting the agenda for your relationship with your significant mm -hmm. other, mm -hmm. to the extent that you get a more flexible schedule or you get uh, these protected hours, yeah. ask for it as an experiment because it may be a little scary for your employer to accept that and say, let's try it and pick a number, you know, a month, mm -hmm. 90 days, six months, and then let's review it and see mm -hmm. if it's working for the workplace. And I will tell you whether I think it's working for me and you may then need to reset the agenda again. I love it, I love it, great. All right, well, Jossie, let's pivot back to you. You know, you have a ton of experience in the startup space um, and the nature of startups is very frenetic. It can be very unpredictable. So as an entrepreneur and as someone who's worked in entrepreneurial environments, what advice would you have uh, for those who are considering working in the startup space? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And I truly enjoy how Joanne and you were talking about work life sway. I think during the pandemic, especially, we all like strengthen our muscle in doing that. <laughs> I remember there was one day I have a board meeting, literally. I was changing a poopy diaper the previous second, and next second I was on Zoom in the board meeting, and I was proud of myself, honestly, at that moment. I was like, wow, you know, I was able to switch from one sway from one to the other in such a second, which I was not able to do pre-pandemic, to be honest. I usually need some time to warm up, but I think, you know, sometimes your environment help you to become the next version of you. Um, yeah, that's a mom <laughs> win, Jossie, that's a mom win. Yeah. So talking yeah. about star life or entrepreneurial, yes, I, you know, I have kind of employee number one career track and I thriving ambiguity. I function the best when, you know, it's a situation of like, no one has ever done it and nobody knows what to do. And that's like really my sweet spot. You don't have to be like me um, working in, in the startup environment and or entrepreneurial environment, but I think the good news is that your mom life will actually propel for your success um, life in, if you want to, you know, be in the entrepreneurial environment on several things. I think, you know, number one, constant iteration and pivoting, you know, any moms who try to feed a six month old solid food knows how, what that means, <laughs> you know, try it. Okay. He doesn't like sweet potato. Um, try something else and then try it. And then, you know, find ways to mix sparkly into something that he likes. You know, it's like, it's about taking a small step, iterate and pivoting, and then find a solution. So I think that is a very important uh, qualification for startup because you very rarely, almost impossible, you will have all the information you need when you need to really make a decision. So what you can do is you can always try to take the best possible next step with all the information that's available, resource that's available to you. So very similar in your mom life and your startup, a startup life. Second, build the best team. Um, I think in the startup, you know, it is, you need to have the incredible talent in every position in your startup. And if your company only has five people, one, pe one person is 20% of your workforce. So you have no wiggle room for any weak people. Um, you have to bring the best people on the team and help them be the best they can be. So your team collectively can be an A plus team. Same here in your family. Um, I remember during, well, you, obviously you, you create those people, <laughs> you choose your people in your village, your partners. Um, I remember vividly uh, when the pandemic hit, me and my husband, we were already in very rapid uh, facing, facing startup life. And all of a sudden we have to 24 seven become the childcare um, giver of a four, two year old Timothy and five year old Jeremy at that time. So we instantly overnight promote Tim, uh, Jeremy to be the manager of the two year old Timothy. And we, we had a team building meeting and then we said, Jeremy, there is someone called coronavirus who's really bad. He's out there so that nobody can go out. Mommy has mommy's job. Daddy has daddy's job. Can you make Timothy your job? And then, you know, helping out. And Jeremy was like, love all those hero movies. He was like, yes, you know, we're a team together. We're fighting this coronavirus. And <laughs> so um, I think that works like, you know, it was it, it actually worked out very fantastically um he will he will take responsibility on timothy when we were both on meetings um and i think lastly um you know be vulnerable be vulnerable is one thing that i learned um that helped me get a better become a better person working in the entrepreneurial environment as well as a mom i think um, if you are vulnerable, you don't have the mindset coming in and thinking, this is my big idea, let me prove to the world that I was right. And you are more, you know, acceptive to new ideas, you're more curious, you're more open-minded. And same thing with how you deal with your child. I've been very honest with my um, challenges at work with Jeremy. I remember there was one time I was worried about a conversation with a coworker because I anticipate there were be some pushback in the ideas that I will bring up. So, you know, in the, I pick up Jeremy and then I said, I was honest to him. I said, mommy, mommy's a little bit nervous about this conversation because I'm worried my colleague won't like my idea. And Jeremy was like four year old at that time. He looked at me and say, mommy, even if they don't like your idea, I still think you are the best. You just tell your friends 
don't give up, keep trying, and you will come back come up with a better idea. I was like, wow, totally mind blowing because it was fascinating to see your child internalize what you have been using to encourage them and then come back right to you at the same time, at the time that you needed the most. So I think be confident your mom life is preparing you well for the start, more entrepreneurial environment if you want to be in that spot. And Bryn, I'd like to jump in here, may I? Yes, of course. Nice. So in order to get interviewed for my book, you had to have worked at some point for what I consider to be a significant size company, a company with at least $100 million in revenue. But I didn't care what size company you were working for at the time of the interview. And so a significant number of the women in those younger wave did decide to leave corporate America and begin their own companies. And so they were now CEOs of startups. And one of the other beauties about having your own business is guess what? You get as the CEO of that startup to create the corporate culture. And so you had women like Jen Hyman, the CEO and co-founder of Rent the Runway, who starts this business and then is able to put a family friendly face on the company. She doesn't initially offer family friendly benefits that are equal across the company, but does have an aha moment several years ago and then makes them standard for hourly and salary employees. And they're very generous. But more importantly, she makes sure that everyone who reports to her is also taking advantage of those family friendly benefits because it's the role model, it's actually working and walking the talk, not just talking it, that makes people actually take advantage of these. And so when her chief technology officer, a guy, is about to go off on his parental leave, she insists that he broadcasts his plans to take the full multi-month paid leave, not only to his team, but to everyone in the company. And what she told me is that before that, relatively few guys took their full paid parental leave and after the CTO did, every guy who had parental leave coming to him took the full leave. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you know what I hear from both of your answers is that being a mom can make you a better boss, right? And I think you cited research that showed that motherhood positively affected leadership performance because it makes you more empathic. You're able to prioritize and streamline things more efficiently. You have to get a lot done. Um, you're a better listener. Uh, I think some of the you know, better delegating. So, yeah. so yay, yay us. Well, let's get, let's talk a little bit about the workplace now. Um, I think the as I mentioned in the intro, flexibility, remote work, kind of got has gotten the upper hand the past two two years because of the pandemic, and that has been an improvement. Um, that has made people have saner lives. I mean, initially we were all going insane when it first happened. I had children at home too, so it was horrible, but we got there. But how, how do we maintain some of the progress that we've made, Joanne, and make work workable for parents? And you know, feel free to cite some more companies that, because you had more than just the ones we've discussed in your, in your book, who are going above and beyond to make working parenthood work. Well, I do think it's really important to recognize that there has been this tremendous shift in employers' attitudes about, frankly, whether you can be productive when you're working mm -hmm. remotely. And no one is ever going to challenge whether that is a feasible option. But what I think is important going forward is to make sure that those of us who choose to continue to work remotely all the time are not lost in the shuffle and somehow get overlooked when it comes to promotion decisions or even plum assignments. And that's why some of these pay setter companies that I highlight in the last chapter of the book are making sure that that doesn't happen. PwC being one of those, which was again, a leader in making work workable for parents, particularly women before the pandemic, and which has made a, a very verbal and public commitment to saying they're going to track what the promotion rates are like and advancement schedules are like for those who continue to work remotely versus those who end up in the office again, either full or most of the time. 
But I think it's also important to highlight companies like American Express, which like PwC was on the cutting edge of doing the right thing for working parents before the pandemic, and which now as they move to post pandemic are giving everyone the option for what kind of schedule works for them. But one of the things that they did that I thought was very significant pre pandemic was not only to make parental leave much more generous, but they acknowledge the fact that this is, can in some cases create a burden for those of us who are supervising the team that is carrying on while everybody else or some people on the team are off on parental leave. And so they asked and found out that what these supervisors wanted and gave them were temporary staffing subsidies so that those who already have grown children or have no children don't feel like they're taking on a bigger burden and feel resentful when those parents who have taken leave come back to work. That's great. Yeah, and I think that, and that was Amex, right? I, they also did a big push, I think, for, for, par for fathers to take leaves. Absolutely, actually, American Express is very fathers. much like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, great. Um, so as we, I'm just kind of looking and I saw Ellen's note in the chat, we're going to begin Q&A in a few minutes. I, I think I'll just have a last question for both of you. And that is, you know, in how, what do working mothers need to know now? I'd say just what would be kind of your bottom line advice? What do working moms need to know now? Jesse, I can start with you and then close with, with Joanne. Yeah. Um, I think there is a bigger kind of macro level and that there's a micro level of your own family. Looking at the macro level, um, the job market is extremely good right now. If you have been thinking about returning, it's totally a job seekers market um, right now. And because of the pressure of the talent wall, so employers are really strengthening and enhancing their, the benefits they offer uh, to acquire and retain the best talent. Um, so that's one aspect of it, but always like I would encourage anyone to look at your micro level, which is your family. Um, not only myself, I feel a lot of moms with young kids, we feel the war has moved on from the po to the co post COVID war, but we are the only group of people who still live in that with you know, no vaccine for little kids, daycare still from time to time closed with positive case. Sometimes it can be a little lonely. I feel you if you are you are there too. Um, you feel it feels like everyone has moved on, but we're still very much in that. It can be exhausted. And um, as an MIT alum, I can also relate to that if you feel kind of considering down shifting your career or take the break, even if you need it, is um, a waste of your MIT um, degree. I remember bringing that was the how I feel the very first time I walked into your office. I think seven years ago, I was clearly in a position that I struggle with as a new mom. But I honestly feel like a little bit ashamed of even thinking about taking another opportunity with more flexibility because I was like, I am an MIT alum. Am I not supposed to be here and change the world? How can I even think about like, you know, done shifting? Um, if you feel that way, I, 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 I would, I would, I'm so lucky to have Brain coaching me at that time because she literally her encouragement unhooked me. So basically, it's like take the break you need, you'll come back stronger. I mean, so that really unhooked me, and I'll give you the same advice. You know, if you, if taking a break is what you need now to prioritize your and your family's well being, do it. Um, the world will still be there. <laughs> for you when you when you are ready to come back and will come back stronger. There are some great examples in Power Moms of women who took these breaks and whose careers actually benefited as a result. Yeah. And in one case, this woman, when she took her next job, she actually negotiated into her employment contract that there would be times when she would have to leave work in the middle of the day to deal with issues related to her children. And because the company really wanted her, they gave it to her. And so I think one of the larger points here that Jossi is making is don't try and fight your battles alone. If there is not already a women's employee resource group where you work or an employee resource group for parents, go to HR and try and get one started and make sure you have a powerful executive as the sponsor for the employee resource group who can make sure that your agenda is heard. 
And one of the things that you ought to be doing through that employee resource group is getting some coaching on how to network effectively virtually to the extent that you are choosing to work remotely predominantly or all the time, because it's not the same to network virtually as it is to network in person, but it's a skill that you can acquire. Yes. For sure. And you want to remain engaged. Well, did you have anything to add to the what do working moms need to know now, Joanne, before we go to Q&A? Well, I think those are the two points that that I would add, which is just remember that you are not alone and that there are resources. If you don't already have them, you need to be part of a group that forms an employee resource group. I also think that it's really important for working moms to ditch the guilt. And there are 10 hacks in that chapter in my book, of which I think the most important one is the notion of practicing self-care. Because if we don't put on our masks first, we can help others. And self-care is not selfish care. It is selfless. Amen. And I would say too, just from listening to your both of your answers, and Jossie, I remember I still remember the first time you came into my office seven years ago. Is we have to give ourselves grace. We have to give ourselves grace, all of us, whether regardless or not, you're a mother. We're human beings. We're doing the best we can with what we have. Every day is different. The resources we have are different. The time we have is different. The energy we, level we have differs from day to day. So give yourself grace. You know, you can just. Accept yourself for where you're at and who you are and who you're not. I think it just becomes easier to make peace with what you go up against. I have this surfer girl here in my office and it reminds me of a mantra, which is we cannot control the wind or the waves, but we can learn how to be good surfers. And I think that's a really good context for how we can navigate motherhood too. So, so let's pivot. Ooh, we're at 148. Let's pivot to um, questions in the chat and I think I'll start while I look at the chat here is one of the questions we got in advance of the the session. Um, I'll just start to throw out and I'll I'll give this to you, Joanne, because I know your book addresses some of this. And that was, do you have any tips to share for professional advancement when you are trying to get pregnant or are expecting or return from maternity leave? Well, that is a question that lots of women wrestle with, Bryn. And of course, there's different answers to each of those questions. I think when you're trying to get pregnant, frankly, it is a private matter that is frankly not any of the business of your employer. I remember one of the younger executive moms was worried about the fact that she was showing up late to some of her team meetings because she had to go for fertility counseling or get some eggs extracted. And, you know, she just finally realized she would deal with it without having to share what was going on in her private life. Once you are pregnant, I think one of the beauties of everyone working remotely is there have been a number of new moms out there who have totally concealed their pregnancy for all nine months because they've been on Zoom the entire time and nobody saw them below their shoulders. But for those who are returning to the office, I think it's really important to address the pregnancy as any other business issue in terms of prioritizing, you know, what needs to be taken care of when, of making it clear to your colleagues and your boss, your intentions to return to work, but also organizing ahead of your leave, what it is, you know, who will do what, and the fact that you don't want to be bothered because this is a very important time in your life. And then in terms of the return to work, I think trying to negotiate this phased return that I had talked about before, uh, coming back on full-time pay at part-time uh, hours and get that for as long as possible, but make sure it's something that's offered to everybody and it's not just a one-off. And so, you know, there is solidarity in numbers. Those would be my answers to that, Bryn. Thank you. I also think employers need your books. You know, they should be giving these out at, uh, as part of that maternity leave package. Um, we did get a question. I like that idea. <laughs> so, um, uh, we got a, ch- a question in the chat from Tamara. Tamara, I don't know if you want to come off camera or, or at least yeah. off mute, no, no pressure. Sure, yeah. Ask. Yeah, no great. Yeah, just my, so I'm, I'm 
early mid forties and had two young kids um, and have been working on my own entrepreneurial the last 10 years or so. Um, and the thing that I find that is still challenging is, I don't know, I guess like men in their fifties and above, and you deal with them all the time, right? Because they're the guys that are leading businesses or organizations and they still just act really old school with the kid stuff. So like people that are in their thirties, younger, or people in their early forties, totally fine, especially coming out of pandemic, you know, meaning they're okay that, yeah, you've got kids and you're doing these other things, but there's a certain generation that they're still just very like, oh, can she actually do both of these things? Or they act awkward when there's a phone call. Like the example I gave, like I'm picking my kid up from school and I joined the Zoom because I know I can do both, right? So then don't act mm -hmm. weird about the fact I'm picking up my kid. Anyways, I don't know what to do with them, I guess is my, my question. Yeah, there still are those gendered expectations that these older baby boomer generation males have. Um, Joanne, thank you for carving the way for us all. What can we do with your, <laughs> your counterparts, your male counterparts? I think in that situation, what I would suggest you do is have a private, separate conversation with this male colleague and just kind of gently ask him kind of where he's coming from. This could be somebody whose wife always stayed home and, and he has really no great understanding of the fact that not only do you make it work, but frankly, you're more effective on the job because you have kids for some of those reasons that was, was outlined by Bryn. You are a much more empathetic leader. You know how to multitask as evidenced by the fact you're on the Zoom call while you're picking your children up at school. And just highlight all the advantages that you are bringing to the role and essentially act as your own advocate, but at the same time, try and figure out better where he's coming from uh, without acting resentful. That, that would be my recommendation. I'd be curious to hear what Jossie says. Yeah, Ashley Tamara, um, I'm so excited for you because I think you have a great opportunity to help this person become a more empathetic leader. And also once he become a more empathetic leader, every woman work with him afterwards will benefit from um, you trying to help educate him about the other side of the world. I think he probably just never had a chance to pick into a working mom's life and then getting a sense of um, how strong he has a multitasker operator, um, strategic thinker, all at the same time a working mother can be. Um, so if you can, I would, if I were you, I'd probably try to establish a, a relationship with, with him that's more casual, less professional, and then from there, kind of just helping understand your entire world and then how you can still be very much, you know, high achieving and even more, even more productive as a working mother. It's not easy because I've got kind of feedback or look like that too. Um, and sometimes it can even like help you affect how you are believing yourself or, or your self-confidence. So it's not easy. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, you can make small progress by trying different ways and see which one works. And when you when you find something works, share back with us because so we, that we can all apply that to people around us too. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and I think curiosity, right? Asking questions rather than being defensive. Hey, tell me a little bit about your life. Let me tell you about mine, right? And own it, own who you are, own all the value you bring. Um, I think sometimes that's, you know, we have this divisiveness because people don't talk to each other. I think it's time to talk and share and, um, and the more he gets to know you, I think the more he will respect who you are and what you do. So, all right, well, I'm looking at the time, it's 1.55, so I'm gonna wrap there. I didn't see any other questions in the chat other than Mahalia, you threw something in. I think the last suggestion you're looking for is phased return is what um, Joanne had said. So, so this uh, brings us to the close of our program today. Um, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. I hope you'll consider taking something away from this and implementing it in your own life, right? Or even advocating to your employer strategies that you learned here today that you think might be more helpful to us all navigating this journey of working parenthood. Um, a few notes. For those of you who might want to purchase Joanne's book or have purchased Joanne's book, she has graciously agreed to uh, sign a copy of your book. I'm just going to demo. She sent me a personalized placard when I purchased the book, and she'll do the same for you um, to make it special. So her 
Email is going up in the chat, so feel free to directly email Joanne and she will get you that placard. So thank you, Joanne, for doing that. Um, we're also popping a resource sheet into the chat for those of you who attended, and that will be a nice um, uh, supplement to today's conversation with some of the resources we included. And finally, be on the lookout for a survey that will be coming your way. Uh, do you want more programming that targets women? Please let us know or your feedback is really valued. So um, in closing, I just want to thank you, Jossie. Thank you, Joanne, thank for you. sharing so openly. Um, I think the conversation we had here was great. It was being able to be in the community of other people who are navigating or have navigated these waters can be really empowering. Um, I want to just emphasize something that was said earlier, it takes a village. You can't do it alone, so don't even try. Lean in, ask for help when you need it, give support, and that's really how we can all thrive and not just survive. So, um, so I hope I hope you all enjoyed today's conversation. Um, that's it. I think I'm gonna close, and my pit crew behind the scenes is gonna wrap us up here. Be well. Have a great day. Have a great week, and um, keep fighting the good fight, ladies. Let's do it. All right. Have a good have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.